One. Do you know what this is? I know you think you do. In this video, I'm going to tell you what it is, and more important, why it matters. It was way back in 1799. Napoleon was sweeping into northern Africa when his soldiers, digging in the town of Rashid or Rosetta, discovered a strange looking object uh -huh. in the sand. Realizing its value, an officer brought it to Napoleon, who was obsessed with history. Napoleon lost the campaign, so that's how it ended up in the British Museum, where to this day it remains the museum's most popular selfie booth. And now for the why. As in, why did you click on this video if you already know the answer? Let me assure you, you don't. On this 2,000-year-old artifact, the priests of Egypt praised their Greek conqueror, Ptolemy V. Epiphanes in three languages, Ancient Greek, Demotic Egyptian, and Hieroglyphic Egyptian. At the time of its discovery, the first of these languages was mostly known, the second barely known, and the last a complete mystery. The story that we all know is that by comparing these three languages, archaeologists were finally able to crack the code that had baffled scholars for centuries. It's a great story and a useful metaphor for selling language apps but only partially true. The man who deciphered Egyptian hieroglyphics, Jean-Francois Champion, mostly used alternate source material to crack the code of ancient Greek hieroglyphics. So what is the real why? I'm glad you asked. Strangely enough, the stone casts light on a baffling passage of scripture found in Isaiah 1918. In that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the City of the Sun. The language of Canaan, as we all know, is Hebrew. So was there ever a time in history when the five cities of Egypt spoke Hebrew? Well, no. But let's just think about this for a moment. This rock was made in 195 BC. Nobody speaks or writes in Egyptian hieroglyphics anymore. Egypt was conquered by Alexander the Great in 332 BC. And for the next thousand years, Greek became the lingua franca of Egypt, including Hierapolis, the city of the sun. Oddly enough, Greek was also the language of Canaan, or Palestine, as the Romans would call it. In fact, the Old Testament of the Bible was translated mm. into Greek in Egypt in the 3rd century BC ah. and stored at the famous Library of Alexandria. The New Testament was written in Greek, and when the Apostles quoted from the Old Testament, it was the Greek translation, the Septuagint, that they were quoting. And when the Roman Empire became Christianized during the reign of Constantine in the 4th century AD, Christianity became the largest religion in Egypt. So in a very practical way, this verse came true. But it didn't last forever. Today, most Egyptians speak a form of Arabic. And Canaan, or modern-day Israel and Palestine, speak a plethora of languages, including English. So ultimately, this verse is pointing to the end times in history, when Christ will come again and set up his eternal kingdom on earth. What will be the language of Canaan and Egypt then? I do not know. But if it's Hebrew, sign me up for the Rosetta Stone app. But for now, it's comforting to know that there was a time already when God truly did visit this earth and Egypt spoke the language of Canaan. What is this stone we've been talking about? The Rosetta Stone. But then, you already knew that. Two. Do you know what this is? I know you think you do. I'm going to tell you what it is, and more important, why it matters. It was way back in 722 BC, or as 2 Kings 17.6 puts it, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria, and placed them in Hala, and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. Who was this Assyrian king who captured Israel? Uh -huh. The Bible identifies him as Sargon. Mm. Isaiah 20 verse 1. In the year that the supreme commander sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it. 
Sargon's conquering of Samaria was a significant event because it marked the end of the northern kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom of Israel, or Judah, wouldn't fall for another hundred years. That is why the Jews in Jesus' day despised the Samaritans as a mixed population of many different nations, cultures, and religions. However, for many years, skeptics argued that this story wasn't even true. Uh -huh. The writers of the Bible created a king between Shalmaneser and Sennacherib that did not exist in history. The Bible was wrong. Uh -huh. But then, between 1841 and 1854, the French consul Victor Place excavated a lost city in Corsica and discovered cuneiform inscriptions of Sargon II on a nine-sided clay barrel. This was one of 14 clay barrels discovered in Corsabad, but the only one with nine sides. All the others had 10. It was also one of the four that survived transportation to Paris. The others were lost when the raft carrying the artifacts was attacked and sunk by thieves who were disgruntled by the excavation's poor excuse for treasure. Little did they know that the clay cylinders contained a treasure that was far more valuable than gold or silver. In the inscribed words of Sargon II on the nine-sided clay cylinder, he states, The city of Samaria I besieged I took. 27,280 of its inhabitants I carried away. 50 chariots that were among them I collected. This corroborates the fall of Samaria in the Bible perfectly. And that's why it matters. But there is an even bigger why. As in, why was this king lost to history in the first place? Well, let me tell you. After Sargon II was defeated in battle, his son Sennacherib became the next king. Out of superstition, Sennacherib built a new capital in Nineveh and never recorded anything about the ignominious reign of his father. The former capital of Khorsabad was abandoned <laughs> and eventually buried in the sands of time. And that's how Sargon II was lost to history, but not to the Bible. What a wonderful reminder of the faithfulness of God's word and the foolishness of men. So what is it? The Sargon Cylinder. But then, you already knew that. Free. Do you know what this is? Uh -huh. I know you think you do. I'm going to tell you what it is and more important, why it matters. Gideon's nickname was Jerubbaal, which means Baal will contend. After Gideon broke down his family's altar to Baal, they gave him this nickname, Jerubbaal. In other words, let Baal deal with him. We can't do anything with this kid. But Gideon's faith was not always so strong. When God called on Gideon to defend Israel against the Midianites, Gideon asked God for a sign. He put a fleece outside and said, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. When God performed this miracle, Gideon said, now make the fleece dry and the ground wet. So God did that too. How many of us are just like Gideon? Later, when the Midianites were invading, Gideon gathered 32,000 Israelites to fight them. But Gideon didn't really get it. It wasn't about him. God needed to teach him a lesson. So he sent 22,000 of those Israelites packing because they were afraid. But God wasn't done teaching Gideon. When they got to a stream, God told Gideon to send packing all the Israelites that lapped like dogs and only keep the ones that scooped the water in their hands. Those guys must have been really thirsty 
because there were only 300 of them left. But God wasn't done teaching Gideon. He brought him down to the enemy camp, which is described as being grasshoppers, or the sand of the seashore. And I'm sure Gideon was afraid, so God brought him up real close so that he could hear what the Midianites were saying. One man told about a dream that he had of a barley cake that rolled down the hill and crushed his tent. The Midianites, for all their numbers, were afraid of Gideon, and more importantly, Gideon's God. And now Gideon worshipped God. When Gideon returned to the 300, he announced, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into your hand the host of the Midianites. And then he gave them an empty pitcher and a trumpet. When they blew the trumpets, they smashed the pitcher, revealing the torch that was inside them. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon, they shouted, and then the Midianites fled. It's a great story of faith in God, and especially poignant for us today, because archaeologists have found the inscription Jerubbaal at Kerbet al rai in the Judean foothills not far from Lachish. The inscription is dated based on its stratigraphical context, pottery typology, and the shape of its letters to approximately 1100 BC, the time of Gideon in the Bible. So why is it important? The name Jerubbaal inscribed on a broken pot dating to the time of Gideon is an amazing confirmation of the veracity of the Bible. So what is it? Uh? The Jerubbaal inscription. But then, you already knew that. Four. Do you know what this is? Uh? I know you think you do. Keep watching, and in five minutes, you'll know what it is, and more important, why it matters. It was way back in 691 BC. Assyria was the most powerful nation in the world, conquering every city in Canaan, every city except Jerusalem. The siege of Lachish in northern Israel was memorialized on countless brass friezes in Nineveh, many of which still survive today. But there are no friezes of the siege of Jerusalem. After hearing of the Assyrian conquest of Judah, Hezekiah stripped the gold off the temple walls and sent it to Sennacherib in tribute. But this was not enough. A short time later, Sennacherib sent word demanding the king's complete surrender. He mockingly promised to provide the king with 2,000 horses if he could find riders to put on them. Sennacherib's supreme commander also warned the people on the walls in their own language not to trust Hezekiah. Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? When Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and went into the <laughs> temple. But then God sent a word to Hezekiah through his prophet Isaiah, saying, Do not be afraid of what you have heard, those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. As the Assyrian army surrounded the walls of Jerusalem, King Hezekiah prayed to the Lord for deliverance. And that night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, mm. king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. It's a great story of the pride of men and the power of God. But is that all it is? 
just a story. Uh-huh. For years, that's exactly what secular skeptics argued. Huh. But then, in 1830, a clay prism-shaped artifact dating to 691 BC was discovered in the site of ancient Nineveh. In ancient cuneiform, the prism documents how Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem resulted in the king of Judah, Hezekiah, being shut up like a caged bird. So why didn't Sennacherib destroy Jerusalem like he did the other cities in Israel? According to the Taylor Prism, which mentions Hezekiah by name, the king of Judah paid a hefty tribute, including his own daughters. This explanation may have been believable to modern scholars, Mm. but not to the ancient Ninevites. Once back home, Sennacherib embarked upon an enormous propaganda campaign. He commissioned thousands of artisans to decorate the city with miles of brass and stone friezes, like ancient billboards announcing his great victories against the cities of Canaan and especially Lachish, which was a major stronghold only about 37 miles from Jerusalem. But I guess his expensive propaganda campaign wasn't enough because soon his own kids would murder him. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons, Adremelech and Sherezer, killed him with the sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat, and Esarhaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. Back in those days, if a king suffered a major defeat, it was a sign that the favor of the gods had left him. This would explain why he was praying in the temple when he died and why his own sons assassinated him. But what was this embarrassing (laughs) defeat that cost him his life and his kingdom? How about failing to conquer the largest and most infamous city in Canaan, Jerusalem, and the mysterious supernatural loss of 185,000 of his soldiers? The Taylor Prism is an amazing confirmation of the historical accuracy of the Bible, and that's why it matters. It's also why you should believe God's word when it warns of the judgment coming. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what is it? The Taylor Prism. But then, you already knew that. Do you know what this is? Uh I know you think you do. I'm going to tell you what it is and why it matters. In 2018, archaeologists in northern Israel made an amazing discovery at what they believed to be Joshua's altar on Mount Ebal. It was a small lead object the size of a postage stamp with tiny markings engraved on it. After carefully unfolding and analyzing the object, archaeologists were able to read the following message. Cursed, cursed, cursed. Cursed by the God Yahweh. Deuteronomy 27 recounts an amazing story which relates to these curses. It says, When you have crossed the Jordan, these tribes shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these tribes shall stand on Mount Ebal to pronounce curses. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. What follows is a long list of blessings and curses that would follow if Israel followed or did not follow God's laws. After the recitation of each curse, the children of Israel would say, Amen. For years, skeptics argued that this event huh. never happened. It was just a story in a book. So there. But then they found Joshua's altar in the exact place where the Bible said it was. Ah. And not only that, but they found a curse tablet with the name YHWH, or Yahweh, on it. Dated to 1406 to 1100 BC. Roughly the time in history when the Bible indicates the conquest began. One lesson we can derive from this amazing discovery is that the Bible is not a collection of myths. It is history. But the second lesson is perhaps even more important. 
one side of the valley, Mount Gerizim, was for the blessings you would get for obeying God. The other side of the valley, Mount Ebal, was for curses you would get for disobeying God. On what mountain are you standing? Have you committed your life to following God or following sin? God is warning you today to follow him with everything you do and say and think. If you do that, he promises blessings, not just on earth, but eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. So what is it? The curse tablet. But then you already knew that. Hi, I'm David, and I really need your help to get the message out. Please subscribe to my channel and watch the next one.